right. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Jonathan, and I'm a PhD student in the New York Devils Lab from Yvonne Gao in Singapore. And so I'm very happy to be given the opportunity, thanks to the, uh, to the organizers, to talk about the first project coming out of our lab about the protection of the non classical features of the, of the cat state. So my talk is organized quite straightforward. In the beginning, I'm going to talk about some motivation. Why do we care about that? Then I'm going to, into, to develop some intuition about why what we are doing helps in conserving those non-classical features, followed by the experimental details. And finally, I'm going to talk about the experimental data we call. Um, so I suppose everybody is very familiar with cat states. Cat states are generally in um, quantum optics defined as the coherent superposition of two coherent, um, of two coherent states. And we distinguish between the even and the odd cat states, which have the neat properties of being eigenstates of the parity operator, which has implications for reuse in the one code, um, where they are quite famous in the sense that you can use the two leg cat state um, to strong noise bias. Um, the four leg cat state has empirically been the first error correction code to reach the break even point. And furthermore, cat states are also valuable resources for metrology or for teleportation and cryptography, which I think we've also heard already um, in this conference. So in CQD, you usually find cat states in high Q data. What you can see here is our device and the schematic of it, where in pink we have a correct stuff line cavity, which hosts the cat state. In green, we have a control transmon that is used to not only have universal control over the cavity, but also to read out. And then finally, yellow, you have the reader resonator, which we use to cope the transform state and therefore also the, uh, the, cat, uh, the cavity. Now, we choose to operate our system in the low dispersive, dispersive coupling regime, where we have a chi of approximately 40 kilohertz. And we do that for two reasons, because we kind of want to store cat states for a long amount of time. So we want to have relatively nice coherence times. And furthermore, we want to mitigate any higher order nonlinearities like square effects. Now, it's quite well known that the dominant loss channel in those cavities is photon loss, single photon loss, with dephasing time significantly higher than that. And now, if you have a cat state in a cavity and you have single photon loss, two things happen. Well, you have, first of all, loss of energy and dephasing. And if you start with a relatively small cat state, like a kitten state, you will see that both these effects kind of happen at the same time scale. Now, generally, we don't want kittens, but actual cat states, meaning we have to have a large R. And now you can see that the two time scales become quite different, namely that the phasing is significantly faster than relaxation. If you kind of saw when I have a blue cat, I'm talking about the odd cat state, and then the black cat means it's completely defaced. And the spoiler, now, what can we do about that? This is kind of what this um, experiment was about. It turns out that if you reshape your cat and phase space, that you're able to significantly um, reduce the dephasing time. So yeah, you can see that the cat is still a little bit blue. Now, this is kind of the motivation. And now I'm going to talk about uh, the, the problem. Now I'm going to talk about how to get some intuition about why compressing the state actually helps and having longer coherence times. And for this, I'm going to talk about phase space. And, most well known is, of course, the Wigner function, I would say, which is defined as the parity of um, as the expectationality of the displaced parity operator. And is in CQD experiments readily available, usually, by simply measuring parity, which you can do very easily in a time scale, a time scale of chi. And in those Wigner functions, since they are good phase based representations, they contain all the information about the cat state, meaning we can see the size of the cat in the blobs. And the coherence, the kind of non classicality, if you might say so, in the fringe. Now, I already said before that we operate our system in the low dispersive coupling regime, which means also that we don't have access to the Wigner function um, because the Wigner function scales with chi, which for us is quite small. And luckily, there's another way of finding out about the state called the characteristic function. And there are two ways to define the characteristic function. One is to Say it's the expectation value of the displacement operator, but also if you come from the Wigner function, it's the double Fourier transform, so they're directly related. 
And while the Wigner function is quite nice in the sense it's intuitive, the Gino classical phase space Wigner function makes a lot of sense. Character characteristic function is not so intuitive. That as you can see here, the size of the cat is now actually encoded in the fringes in the middle, while the coherence is encoded in the block. And while there's kind of an established way for the Wigner function to think about non classicality in terms of the negativity or the center point of the Wigner function, in the characteristic function, that's not really the case. And for this study, we focus on the amplitude of those coherence plots. So this is the metric we are going to to um, to observe over time to say if we are able to um, prolong the coherence time somewhere. Now, if we want to have an understanding about why um, compression our state actually helps, we can actually go to optics and this is where I think it's quite helpful to talk to people from other fields because I wasn't really aware how neat this picture works, but to talking to people from optics, what they usually do is when they think about photon loss, they think about sending a state, a state to a beam splitter. And with this, we can very easily find how a weakness function is affected by photon loss, namely if you have a state and you send it to a beam splitter with M um, transmittivity eta here, which is a function of the time you wait in T1, of course. And you simply assume that you have vacuum in the other input, that's how we model photon loss. Then you can find your output weakness function, um, the joint output, uh, output weakness function simply by multiplying the two input weakness functions where you have a change of coordinates as given by your beam splitter. And if you now integrate the particle pair ball out, the thermal and the weakness function of the thermal state, and you do a change of phase, uh, of Integration variables, you can end up in with this kind of neat expression, which simply says, okay, my Wigner function after photon loss can be expressed as a convolution of the input Wigner function. And from here, we can quite easily move on to the characteristic function because, well, they are simply related by a double Fourier transform. And if you take a Fourier transform of a convolution integral, then you simply Fourier transform the part itself and you multiply them. In other words, if we have the characteristic function, photon loss is going to affect it by acting as a sort of Gaussian filter. So we have our old characteristic function that is really scaled, and we multiply it with the Gaussian. And the sigma of the Gaussian is related to, um, your, uh, to the um, transmittivity of your beam split. And to put this in pictures, if we start with a cat state and we send it to a photon loss channel, in other words, we send it through this Gaussian filter. Everything that's outside for um, here, outside, the, let's say this um, green circle will be strongly, um, from, uh, strongly mitigated. And now if we would be able to make a compressed or squeezed cat state, you can see that now you're able to fit all the components into your Gaussian filter, and therefore you can protect it against photon. Now the question is how can we create those states, which is the interesting part in some. And for this, I have first to talk about kind of the first army knife of the low coupling regime, which was um, neatly discovered and implemented by Alex and Stephen and Philippe Campagnier back. Um, and which is a very useful tool, like everything kind of you want to do in the low coupling regime you can do. And the gate is experimentally very easy implemented by simply playing a sequence of single um, cavity displacement and a single cubic gate in the middle. And to get an intuition about why it's so useful, one can think about kind of a lever and phase space because what this gate does is, is that it allows you to implement conditional um, displacements on the cavity in a time scale faster than chi. And usually, if you would naively think, if you have a Interaction strength of chi between qubit and cavity, all the gates are kind of bounded by chi. And so the ECD gate simply moves far out in phase space to um, kind of takes the lever effect into account that now the phase velocity actually scales with how far you are outside. And by using this, you are able to implement gates that are significantly faster if you are going up and far out in phase space, which is one of the reasons why you want to have a small um, chi as well, because if the curve effect would be too large, you would pick up more and more of those effects the further you are in phase space. 
And the ECD gate, like I said, scales with one over the amplitude of the coherent state, the far you go out and times chi. It's a force together with, um, with qubit rotation of the universal control of the cavity. And finally, it's also the gate that directly gives you um, access to the characteristic function measurement. So using this, we can now go to the, to the scheme that we use for compression, which is based on a protocol that was um, introduced by Jacob Hustle. Um, and the idea is that you have two gates called UNV, which as you can see here, are both to, um, conditional displacement gates. While one is displacing along the x axis and one along the p axis. Now, for experimental purposes, we can decompose this into ECD gates sandwiched by single qubit rotation. And the protocol itself consists of repeating those gates over and over. And the idea of or the intuition of how this works is by considering that the first gate, what the first gate is doing is that you create a superposition of two coherent states. And the second gate, the V gate, will now approximately disentangle cavity and um, qubit. So if you repeat this gate a number of times, what you're doing is that you're creating, that you create a superposition of many coherent states along one axis in the cavity. Now, the definition of a sweet state can also be written as a superposition of basically infinite, um, an infinite amount of coherent states with a Gaussian envelope. And while it's not straightforward to pick your displacement parameters, U and V, to actually match this closely to kind of imitate a um, sweet state, you can simply use an optimizer to find the ideal parameters that will, for example, give you the maximum overlap of the state you create with an ideal sweet, uh, sweet state, which is what we did. And if you want, you can post select in the sense that sometimes it will increase the quality of your state. But it's not always necessary. Sometimes you simply end up with cavity and qubit actually being disentangled. And here we can find different parameters. Um, and one example I give here is that I was telling my um, optimizer to find the uh, sweet state with that is well to to find a state that is very similar to the sweet state with um, six degrees freezing. And it gave me those parameters. And if I implement this, I can find the state, which you can see is not exactly a perfect sweet state if you would compare to a perfect sweet state, since you end up with having a uh, having small fringes over here, which are kind of um, due to um, how to say small um, small. Uh, you simply don't have enough coherent states to make a better approximation of this corresponding sweet state. If you would increase the number of steps, you can also increase the quality of the state. And once you're here, it's relatively straightforward to, oh, sorry, right. So in our protocol, what we do is we generate compressed state with um, always three steps. So in principle, you could use more steps, but we are simply limited by the coherence properties of our system where we have a qubit C2 of approximately 20 microseconds on a good day. And one step of U and V takes about 1.3 uh, microseconds. So using more steps would degrade the state due to the poor coherence properties of our, of our system. And with these three steps, we create different compressed vacuum states with three, 6.7 and 7.6 dB of, um, of compression. And once you have a compressed vacuum state, it's quite easy for our um, superconducting systems to go to a cat state. All we do here is that we play uh, another V gate, which will um, give you basically a state where you end up with an even cat state on the ground state and an odd cat state on the excited state of the transmog. And now, if you post select, you can very easily um, generate a cat state like this. And if instead of a vacuum state, we actually start with a compressed state then we can create our compressed cat state like this. And what you can see here is an experimental data of a compressed cat state with alpha 1.8 and the degree of compression of 6.7. And after this, I think I actually already get to the experimental data. So what you can see here is that we create um, cat state with alpha equal to 1.8. 
and we wait for different amount of time while monitoring the blob in the group. And what you see here on the left side is um, the markers, uh, the experimental data that we expect, while the solid line is the master, or the corresponding theory to the master equation, and they fit quite, quite neatly. And on the right side, you can see three um, measured characteristic functions of our um, of this experiment. Um, as you can see, after 100 microseconds, the blobs are completely gone. You can't see them anymore at all. Now, if I do the same experiment with a compressed cat state, you can see that after 100 microseconds, I can see the um, coherent blob still quite strongly in comparison. And uh, yeah, and I know that, or well, like I suppose that for a lot of people, characteristic functions kind of new and the metric of um, using the blob of characteristic function to quantify non classicality is not as common. So we, of course, also used the data and took a look at the Wigner function. And as you can see here, those are the corresponding Wigner functions to our state. And here also the um, center point, the negativity of the Wigner function is still significantly visible after 100 microseconds in the first case, while completely gone in the non -case. And as a conclusion, if we use this kind of schema based with compression, we can quite significantly preserve the non classical features of uh, can preserve the non classical features of cat state. Um, yeah. So what we did is basically, I would say, two parts. First is the implementation of this protocol where we use ECG gates together with simple, simple qubit gates to deterministically generate compressed vacuum states and then through probe selection compressed cat states. And then we saw that this is able to quite significantly, like by a factor of 10, um, protect the non-classicality against photon loss. And furthermore, I would say it might be interesting to look like if this kind of not perfectly squeezed, but compressed state. So I'm saying compressed because there are slight differences. Like if I say squeezed, one would assume that the expectation values of the quadratures have a certain relation. And for this compressed state, it might, they, they're usually a little bit different. For example, the anti squeezing will be larger than the actual squeezing. So there's a difference between those two things. And I think it might be interesting to see if it might be enough to have a compressed state instead of a squeezed head state. To, have something useful for quantum information process. And furthermore, we're also thinking about using these control schemes to, uh, to implement it on multiple nodes and see if, if we can create, for example, um, yeah, what we can do there. All right. This is my team in Singapore and my, um, uh, my co authors, which, whom I would like to thank for all the help and the discussions along the way. And thank you for your time. We have lots of time for questions. Thanks for the very nice talk. Um, I really like this uh, explanation uh, you know, with the um, transfer function in, uh, in Fourier space. Uh, but I was wondering, is there maybe um, uh, a simpler explanation? For example, is the average photo number occupation Similar to that of the non compressed state? Uh, so, what I also originally thought well, the easiest explanation would be just the average photon number going down, right? And then you kind of get to the same thing. But actually, it turns out that the ideal compression point for Wigner function is a little bit different. Like, it's significantly less photons than the normal cat state, yes, but it doesn't coincide. So, for the Wigner function kind of convolution, so the ideal point for Wigner function would be to make the cat state, the compressed cat state, Perfectly symmetric in phase space. And this doesn't coincide with the minimum photon number. I hope that answers. Okay, thank you for your talk. Um, so I was wondering if it would be possible, given that ECDs uh, give you universal control, yeah. would it be possible to initialize the squeeze cat state directly instead of going through this kind of two step process with full selection? Uh, how do you mean directly? You mean with universal control, right? There's yes, exactly. So just sequences of ECDs and rotation going from vacuum. Uh, I mean, actually, this would be fairly similar. 
right? I mean, the ECD control scheme still relies on repeated application of ECD gates and qubit rotation. Yeah, just wondering so, because here you're posting, you're drawing away off your radiation. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, okay, probably it's possible. Borg just didn't really need to do that, right? We okay. care about creating the state at the end of the day. And we like to have a scheme that is deterministic that we can use and we understand. Um, that worked quite well. So, I think it's possible. Okay, thanks. Uh, sure. Uh, thank, thanks uh, again. Uh, my question was sort of maybe piggybacking on what Sir uh, was asking a little bit. I just was wondering, uh, do, do you have, uh, you showed for us that the coherence gets better as you shrink it and you compress it. Yeah. Do you have a comparison with how that scales with the photon number? I'm sort of curious about this, your, your statement that the coherence is different than the average photon number would tell you. Uh, not, not now, not off the top of my head. I mean, I, it definitely is fairly similar. I mean, you can kind of, the more compressed the state of the phase is, right, the less photons you have kind of per definition. So when you are perfectly spherical, you also have a very small photon number. The exact relation I can't tell you from top of my head, but it's all it's close to the minimum. So like, you are not far off. Thank you. So, thank you. Uh, it's a great talk. Um, I think it's very interesting technically and also fundamentally. So regarding this photon number, uh, mean photon number, the coherence relation, I, I think it's not the right thing to look at because you can have a cat or you can have a coherent state, but the same mean photon number went completely you know, be coherent free, that one would be coherent fast. Right. But on the other hand, there's a diffusion in phase space that happens because of photon loss in the characteristic functions your convolution with a Gaussian. So essentially it's about how much fine structure you can put inside this blob. It's a yeah, discrete exactly. thing. Exactly. Um, and then there's, there's no direct relationship with the mean photon number in that sense. Now, if, are you claiming that any cat state will be better when squeezed? Because uh, when you squeeze a large cat, you will not be able to put it all within the green Gaussian. Uh, I mean, this kind of depends on the exact metric you want to take, right? So, I mean, if you take the coherence plot, it will always be better because you make it smaller, right? I mean, the current plots were kind of quantified by us by the center point. And if I take this as a metric, of course, it's better. So it's kind of like, but this is, I think, why it's not, necessar not necessarily fair for larger um, states because we always get better. The weak negativity, there might be a better metric. And then, yeah, it will still get better. Like for weak net, we get better until you reach this one kind of compression point where you're perfectly symmetric. For any case space, doesn't matter how large you are. When you're perfectly symmetric, you have the maximum amount of, com of Protection against photon loss for the mean symmetric um, in phase space that is basically fitting in a sphere, right? I mean, if you have a huge state, it's kind of looking like this, and with symmetric, I mean something in between like this. So, I mean, the idea is they're kind of that you want to make your coherent sprint in the middle to be a Gaussian, like a symmetric Gaussian, because then you have convolution integral with the Gaussian to um, photon loss, right? If you think about how photon loss affects the Wigner function. And you get the maximum if both of them are got yeah. That's very interesting. So you're, what you're saying is that you win when you have both axes yeah. equally sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Because you're sensitive to and evolution. This is what I found very interesting. Like for superconducting people, that's not so obvious, right? But for objective people, they just ask like you didn't know, like it's so easy, right? It's so obvious. Because to them, that's kind of how they think about the entire problem. Whereas for me, I always thought in terms of mass like equations and so on and so on. And they never do that. They think, think completely different about the same problem. And so it kind of coincides when, it, when we thought about this problem that we had a student, Mia, from Akira's lab coming to our lab. And when he saw it, he just was like, hey, this is very easy, right? And yeah. yeah. So what's the obvious thing for optics? Uh, that photon loss is kind of a convolution um, in the Wigner function. And therefore, you want to make this symmetric to protect the um, coherent sheet. Fantastic. Okay. Thanks. Hey, uh, great results. Thank, uh, thank, thank you. I wanted to ask you about you do the conditional displacement gate to generate the squeeze states. Uh, yes. And then you say you don't get a perfect GD, uh, perfect squeeze right. state. You have like multiple contributions also at other positions. Exactly. And then you do your cat state perturbation, like your conditional displacement. Yes. So you get also you get your two main peaks, but you get also other contributions, right? Uh, so I wanted to ask you about how big they are and how much they're All right. So those are, 
let me start by saying that the protocol itself, in theory, is able to generate very, very good and nearly smooth state. Now, the main thing is if you move to experiment, we have a lot of faults in our system. And because we don't really care about the perfect smooth state, we didn't address all of them. So we could have higher quality in that sense. Um, then, what is it like? Uh, you have like, if you don't have a perfect speed state, right, you will have features further out on phase space. That kind of. Yeah, once speed. you do your condition displacement, you will have like exactly, main like, type peaks. With but some, they're quite insignificant. Like you will not be able, that's yeah, why. Yeah, but what is roughly the, the probability of these other peaks? Like if you would look in the Q distribution compared to the main peak, you know? I mean, I can kind of give you a figure by comparing the amplitude from my head and that's no, like, but you can, you know, by five, five percent. And like, yeah. They have, they have a very well looking speed state in the middle, and then further out, you have small changes coming out, but they are quite small. Like, and just a small follow up could you think about like using your pro the techniques to correct for errors to stabilize these kind of compressed cat things? Uh, to instead of just like doing the compression, I mean, our uh, return back, yeah, yeah, let's solve that. I think. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. So I'm from the optics background. Uh, and my question is, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you show this Wigner function at different times. And then as you are around 100 microseconds, you don't see any, so you see very tiny with the negativity. Yeah. So if you were to put that number in terms of beam splitter, beam splitter reflectivity as a loss, do you know what that is? Uh, I mean, the that would simply be, I know I would have, I mean, the transmittivity is the exponential of minus 100 over 260. Um, I can't calculate that in my head. Okay, I'll calculate it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes, um, I'm also from optical background. So um, so in this experiment, instead of generate like large cast first and then do the squeezing, yeah. you kind of directly generate the speed cast. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Yeah, so. I want to ask if it's were like optical system doing squeezing get is actually kind of easy if you have squeeze state and the filter interaction. So you can squeeze any state instead, like whether it's cast state, GKP state, Fox state, or whatever state. So since you have like squeeze state, and I think your group could also do that per interaction, can, do you think you can do something like kind of arbitrary squeezing get instead of just make the squeeze version of the State. Uh, what do you mean with arbitrary squeeze state? Like squeeze so, any possible state? So you can do squeeze on any state, but because in this work you will kind of make like the squeeze version of the cast state, right? Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um you basically teleport the squeezing gate on the cat, right? I like I'm uncertain. I think it would be possible, but I can't give you a different answer. But let's talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank thanks for the nice talk. I was wondering if you thought about these squeeze cats just in the language of GKP, like thinking about this as a baby GKP code and what you're measuring is essentially a stabilizer of that code? Uh, I mean, we kind of started thinking towards those directions because it was quite interesting that while we we're doing that, we had two theoretical papers coming out by Yang Chiang and I forgot the second um, paper, but who talk about using these cat state, right, as error correction code. And that's kind of when we also started looking into that, but it's still very beginning, so not too much. Um, uh, it's a bit the, the same discussion as uh, has been uh, around right now, uh, uh, and also about the, the photon, like mean for the number uh, discussion that has been at the very beginning. Like, have you thought of like instead of using uh, coherent state or like preparing two coherent states or two squeeze states uh, as your cat and squeeze cat? Uh, using rather a squeezing operator and like trying to take a cat, squeezing it, trying to see how the the noise like like making the same plots and then like unsqueezing it and and see what happens. Uh, Basically, like having a sort of protection that you can do uh, on the. I mean, we could uh, with the protocol. It would I could also undo that the squeezing actually, and um, we don't do the. Mm -hmm. You could squeeze also a cat state. Like, I mean, what we choose to do here, right? We first create compressed vacuum and then create a cat state. We could theoretically also do it the other way around, but we want to minimize the time we are further out on phase space. So we first create these compressed vacuum 
and then displace what would correspond to the corresponding state if you would first create a cat with 1.8 and then compress. So in the end, they are the same state. Only that for the purpose of having better quality, you do it like the other way. All right, that was a very lively uh, question session. Yeah, very thanks good. for the nice question. <laughs> Uh, so we have a 14-minute break, and let's uh, thank the speaker once more. Yeah.